Thank you. And so there's a small swap here. We are going to talk about the science of obesity first, and then we are going to talk about the other uh, effects of obesity beyond just the numbers and weight. And uh, I'm going to take you through this topic of science behind obesity and how I've labeled this uh, from bench to bench side as to what we learn from literature, what is available, and how we use that in clinical practice. So uh, I think I'll cover this topic by covering three broad headings. Uh, I'll talk about the physiology of weight regulation, and believe me, over the last 10 years or so, a lot has changed in understanding of obesity, and uh, we'll look into that. We'll talk about the etiopathogenesis of obesity, and the important point to remember here is that every patient that we see uh, who has obesity has a different story, and we really need to understand why that particular patient has the problem of weight. It's just not that one size fits all and we give a prescription uh, of a diet chart or say that you, know, you uh, eat less and walk more and that will work wonders for all patients with obesity. That doesn't work like that, so we look at into how we assess the etiopathogenesis for that one particular patient who's actually sitting in front of you. And then I would talk about the benefits of weight loss that we all are well aware of, but also how important it is not only to lose weight, but also to maintain that lost weight and the concept of weight regain. So starting straight with the physiology of weight gain, and I think all of us are well aware that it's just not the simple equation of energy in and energy out. It is uh, much more complex than that. I'm sure all of us in our clinical practice have patients coming and telling us, doctor, I have so-and-so person who eats four chapatis, eats a burger, eats every alternate day, and is like this. And for me, even if I drink water, doctor, I water. So we have those kind of patients, and that's why it's important to understand the physiology behind it. and. Uh, when you look at this energy intake and energy expenditure in a little bit more detail, we see that energy intake is fairly simple. It's predominantly because of food, and there isn't really any other source of energy intake. But energy expenditure is a little bit more complex. There is always a resting metabolic rate. I often tell my patients, even if you decide, not to get out of your bed for 24 hours a day, you are going to burn some amount of calories because of your RMR. Yes, there is also thermogenesis, predominantly diet-induced, and this is where sometimes when you say to have normal amount of protein that you should have, because when we know when you digest protein, you burn more calories, so this is somewhere where weight management can play a role. And within physical activity, there could be physical activity which is not exercise dependent, we can't really do much about it. That's about our posture, our muscles that are working all the time. But what is something that's doable is within the exercise domain. So you see very clearly in this graph that you have a lot to change in food because that's the only energy intake kind of what you get in. But for energy expenditure, there is a small component of exercise and a little bit of DIT, but overall there is a lot of it that you cannot change. So looking that food is uh, a big thing, so let's understand why we eat food or what, are the, what is the physiology behind it. And there are three important things to remember. One part of it is the homeostatic eating. Eating because we feel hungry because of these hormones in the hypothalamus that increase your appetite. So this is quite fair enough. All of us do eat when we are hungry. But then there is also eating for pleasure. We may like to eat certain things, and because we get a kind of a pleasure, a kind of kick, if we see something that we really like, and we may eat something for that, and that's not for hunger. We may not be hungry at that time, but we may eat something just for pleasure, and this is also regulated up in the brain. But the good thing is there is a third component, and the third component is voluntary. When we tell our patients with diabetes not to eat sweets, and even if there are sweets on the table, a good dedicated patient may decide by his or her executive function not to take that particular food item. So it is not that always food is only for eating. It can be for pleasure. 
it can be for executive function. Well, all of this is modulated in the hypothalamus by complex mechanisms. There are hormones that increase our appetite. There are hormones that decrease our appetite. And why, as a physician, we need to understand all these hormones are because more and more drug targets are being developed to target these particular hormones. So these hormones are also modulated by the gut, by the adipocytokines, by behavioral, environmental, and uh, several uh, metabolic cues that come back to the hypothalamus. So in short, cutting a long story short, we are speaking of obesity just not as a simple ex ex equation of energy in and energy out. It's much more complex. Today we recognize it as a disease because we understand this is because of the change in these neurotransmitters, change in these biochemical parameters within the hypothalamus modulated by adipocytokines, modulated by gut peptides, and ultimately by environmental factors as well. And as I said before, like we have an omnius octate for diabetes, similarly, we may have an omnius octate for obesity, and we may have specific targets to manage these. And I think we are getting uh, newer drugs which are helping to modulate these. And so with this, I move on to the second aspect of my talk, and this is on the etiopathogenesis of obesity. And I, as I said before, it is very important for us to find out why a particular patient who comes to visit you for obesity management has obesity. It's not always eating more. It's not always walking less. It could be because of hormones. could be because of genetics. could be because of psychological problems. could be because of depression could be because of reduced physical activity. Many times it could be because of lack of knowledge of calories. Patient might be saying, doctor, I'm eating only healthy. They're getting this healthy nutri choice, some kind of a cookie which they think is really healthy. They've ne never really realized that it is so calorie rich. So I think it is important to find out for each and every patient what is the root cause of obesity for that patient. And unless you do that, you really cannot treat your patient with obesity. If, if the depression is the primary problem, un unless you address that, you're not going to get that weight moving down. Yes, there are environmental factors, sociocultural factors, food and ev environment, but a lot of emphasis these days is also coming up from the genetic side. I think all of us today stay in a very obesogenic environment. But then why is it that some patients are morbidly obese, some are obese, some are very thin. Everybody is exposed to that kind of an environment. So there is a, a genetic role. And what we've learned from different twin studies that weight is essentially one of the most inheritable trait in the human body. When we looked at a study, and this is in the community, in 300 mothers, these are old postmenopausal women, and their daughters who are married and settled elsewhere and trying to look at their visceral adiposity, there's a very strong correlation. Even though the environment today is different for these daughters who are married and settled elsewhere, there's a very strong correlation about the visceral adiposity in daughters as compared to their mothers. Several genes have been described. There are several SNPs that talk about appetite, that talk about fat distribution, but I think there is also an emerging role, especially in younger children with obesity, and especially in some parts of the country, especially the place where I work, in Tamil Nadu, in Andhra Pradesh, we have still a lot of consanguinity that happens there. And then there is also the need to identify certain monogenic causes of obesity in these young children, which can go missed. This is a paper from Pakistan, where they found that about 30% of young onset morbidly obese children may have an underlying genetic defect. When we looked at data from Velo, we found that about 16% of our young onset morbidly obese children actually have a gene defect. Why is it important for us to know about it? Today we can do these genetic tests for a much less cost with the help of next generation sequencing, but more importantly today we have specific treatment. So if we find out somebody who has, they're just very obese, young onset obesity, uh, obese children. So when you ask for a genetic test in a young child, in somebody who has obesity, which is less than 10 years of age of onset, somebody who has severe obesity or a family history of obesity, somebody who has hypophagia, and if they have developmental delay, 
or telltale signs of any of these syndromic causes, then you ask for obesity and these tests. So that's about pathophysiology of obesity. And the third aspect, which talks about the benefits of weight loss, which is there, but what is also more important is to prevent weight regain. And when you talk about weight loss, yes, we've all learned in medical school that about 5 to 10% of weight loss is good. It prevents development of diabetes, improves the CV risk, all these benefits that we know. But today, we crave for more. We talk about 5%, but if you talk of 10 to 15% weight loss, we talk of reversal or remission of diabetes. We talk of better benefits in the lipids, in the fatty liver, in the blood pressure, and the CV risk. So overall, yes, uh, weight loss has its benefits. and We want to crave for more. We don't want to stop at 5%. Well, we can achieve 5 to 10% weight loss with lifestyle, with dietary changes. This is a meta-analysis of different lifestyle studies for weight loss, including the look-ahead study. But the problem is that even if we lose a lot of weight, the average duration of follow-up for these studies is about five years. Even if we lose about 15 kgs is the maximum weight loss. When we talk of weight maintenance, that doesn't stand for it. So the, even though the maximum weight loss with lifestyle has been about 15 kgs, the kind of weight maintenance is only about four kgs. And this is true even for if I use meal replacements, if I use intensive behavioral therapy. And therefore, there is a very important concept of metabolic set point, and that's why we need medical management of obesity, which largely helps to reset this set point. So what is the set point theory? If any one of us tries to lose weight, if we lose weight, we do it by calorie restriction, we do it by more exercise, but at the same time, our homeostatic signals work in the opposite direction. They change these hormones in a way that we increase our appetite, we reduce our energy expenditure. And therefore, the use of medications for obesity management that are there, some in the pipeline, some which are already there in the market, help to reset this metabolic set point and ultimately help to prevent weight rate gain. I think the biggest data comes from this famous reality show in the US, The Biggest Loser. And when we follow up these patients, not only for a few months, but even follow up for six years, we clearly realize that as people lose a lot of weight, their metabolic set point works in the opposite direction. What you see in this slide is that the resting metabolic rate is much lower. So the amount of energy they expend after losing weight is much lower. And there are several ways in which you can tackle the set point to prevent weight regain. So I think I'll stop here. The key takeaways from this, mess this slides are behind the signs of obesity that it's not a simple equation of energy intake and expenditure. Today, we understand obesity as a disease, wherein there are changes in the neurochemical markers in the hypothalamus that regulate our appetite and weight gain. There is an environmental component, but an increasingly recognized genetic component as well. And weight loss has its benefits, but it's even more important to prevent weight regain. So I'll stop here, and we'll be back for another session after a talk.